the number of active shooters are up 97 percent. An increasing number of sickeningly violent crimes is being committed by America's youth. Gun violence in America showed a dramatic increase in the murder and gun violence. It was about a 30 percent increase in And last month, a 19-year-old was arrested for the murder of a Stolen cars and gun crimes. Violence that has been on the rise across the nation. Nearly 630,000 abortions were reported. To the so we're 11.4 women over 1,000 who got abortions ages 15 to 44. It is dark and sometimes invisible. This epidemic of suicide is a major public health concern. That was a classic example of what happens when a family gets decimated. Uh, mom and dad divorced when I was two years old. Both of them came from generational curses of parents that weren't present or parents who came from parents who came from parents who didn't know how to parent. And so the product of that was a dad who was fighting the court systems to try to get custody and see his kids who was often pushed out. Um, and then a mom who is trying to just stay afloat. And um, so that left us exposed to boyfriends that she had, that we lived with, that were not the healthiest relationships for us to be around, that led to poverty, that led to all kinds of abuse and hardship uh, growing up. In my teenage years, I just didn't have a lot of supervision. And what I learned was when a young man does not have validation from a father figure, they're going to find that validation somewhere. See, the truth is, my dad had weekend custody. He had some summers. And I have a lot of great memories in there. I'm not forgetful of the camping trips and off-roading and shooting big guns and fishing and more fishing and then more fishing. I am not forgetful of the drag races and the times where I was able to bond with my dad. But the truth is, there were times where the generational curses of addiction filtered through. What that looked like was uh, dad getting drunk a lot. What it, what it looked like was a dad that had a temper that would inspire him to kick down doors and punch walls and yell and scream and fight and hit. I was fortunate that he did not lay a hand on me. Things were challenging. Things were difficult. And a lot of times it felt, the, although I had a dad, and we were spending time together occasionally, that he wasn't there emotionally. He certainly did not teach me about the Lord or what it means to be a man. He would teach me how to swing a hammer or small things here and there. And yes, I believe a lot of times he was absolutely doing his best, but there was utter brokenness that had been passed down for generations. And I was on the way to passing that down too. I got caught up in the gang scene at 17. I had an eight inch hunting knife plunged into my stomach and a screwdriver in my back. I lost nearly half the blood in my body and almost perished. That only made me more angry. I had tried every drug known to man before I left high school, was already an addict and an alcoholic. I was already seeking validation through promiscuity and being with women and giving myself away. That transitioned into my adult life as well. Maybe if I'm a United States Marine and, and I'm a tough guy and I go fight bad guys, and maybe I'm tough enough, maybe I am a man, maybe I have what it takes. <sighs> Iraq for me was a crisis of faith, trying to understand as a man of God, it's supposed to love others as I love myself. How do I justify what I did and what I saw? And then I come home and we're not supposed to talk about it because 
Real men don't struggle with combat. Real men bury it. That's what the World War II heroes did. And that's why their kids didn't have present fathers most of the time. They were emotionally absent. My father grew up during the Depression. My grandfather had come from Wales. He had such a horrible life working coal mines and slate mines. So he gets a chance to come to America, and what happens to him? They put him in one of the most awful places in Joliet, Illinois, which was the U.S. steel plant. He went from coal mines to steel plants, which were low-paying, dangerous work. My grandfather was, was callous. He, he didn't raise his family with love and kindness and tenderness. It was military-type discipline, no love, no, no caring. And my, so my father came from that environment. They grew up during the Depression, didn't have enough to eat. When my dad joined World War II, joined the Army, they had to put him into a camp, a nourishment camp, just to get him healthy enough to be a soldier. He was, they were starving to death. So I can't blame him for the type of environment he came from was passed on towards me. But I was affected horribly. My sister was affected worse than I was. And she's suffering terribly today. I recovered, she didn't. After the Marine Corps, I became a, a businessman and uh, ended up being the first male in my family to get a college degree. And I found myself in a skyscraper uh, working for billion dollar companies as a consultant, miserable out of my mind. And God called me out of the business world and into ministry. And all I could tell you was that I met the Lord. I got to experience His presence while way up in the Rocky Mountains, above 12,000 feet, I began to receive healing from him. It was the first time I felt like I could breathe. I felt like I was claustrophobic, stuck in a box, but then all of a sudden, you know, I've got the breeze on my face and I'm looking down at a lake, sitting in a pile of snow on top of a mountain and just, I felt alive. And the thought occurred to me, why would I not bring other broken people up here? So it started with bringing veterans up there, and then I was working in the inner city as a volunteer, shooting hoops and eating pizza and teaching the Bible every week, and I was like, what would that look like to get some of these kiddos up here in the mountains? And I did. And wouldn't you know, the first trip we, we had, there was a Hispanic gang member and an African-American gang member hugging each other around a campfire, weeping their eyes out for an hour and a half straight. I saw God move in a tremendous way, and I just knew, it just, it struck me at that moment. This is what I was born to do, period. No question about it. I need to pour into young men that were, or are, like I was. And I see myself in them, and in fact, my deepest pain is what cultivates my greatest compassion. And isn't compassion the thing that drives us in love? I mean, we could do ministry work, but not even care about the people that are before us. Or we can care about them to a varying extent, but shouldn't I be in a place where my heart breaks for someone? And when I look at those kids, I, my heart breaks for them because I'm looking at me. 
Well, new studies show that the number of children in the U.S. living without fathers in the home is over 25 percent and continues to rise. But in the small community of Brookshire, just off I-10 in Waller County, these statistics show the rate of fatherlessness is an astonishing 90 percent. In today's Stronger Houston, we profile a Houston-based Christian nonprofit that has branched out into that town in the hopes of standing in the gap for those missing fathers. The streets of Brookshire, a town of about 5,500 people in Waller County, are often slow and sometimes empty. The same can be said for many of their households, empty of a critical segment of the population fathers. It's about a 90% fatherless community. You heard correct. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 90% of the children in Brookshire are being raised without fathers in the home in recent years. 60% of those kids are being raised by a grandparent or great-grandparent. A Houston-based Christian nonprofit is planting roots in this community in an attempt to cultivate stability and promising futures. My name is Ryan Orban. Um, I'm the director of the Hangar Unity Center. This is my home with George since the sixth grade. Uh, it's a mission of Eyes on Me. Sixth grade. You got some trouble today. You look like you were carrying something when you came in. Families have just been robbed over generations, um, and it almost seems like it's strategic. When America was founded, it was an agrarian society, and you know the families were in the homes, and the Industrial Revolution came and it pulled the dads into the factories. And then the wars came, and it sent the dads overseas and pulled the women into the factories. Dads come back from war, and they're all jacked up in the head. You know, and, and then moms are back in the workforce, and so kids are latchkey kids, is how I grew up in the 80s. That became an epidemic. Both parents working, divorce rate went through the roof, um, and it's just uh, gotten worse and worse with each passing generation. Yeah, well, I think that process starts really early in Scripture, that you start seeing the follow this epidemic really uh, play out as early as Genesis 4, where you see a father who did not step up and defend his wife. He didn't step up and lead her well, talking about Adam and Eve. As they were tempted, Adam's role was to protect her and to provide for her. And instead, he neglected that and didn't stop her from partaking of the fruit that God had forbidden. And then you see what happens in the next generation with his sons, where suddenly there's just jealousy and it leads to anger and then it leads to murder, uh, where Cain murders Abel. And then throughout the biblical text, you see example of example of what the fatherless struggle looks like. Sometimes a father just don't know how to stand up to the plate. They just never had it modeled in front of them. When you take the father out of the home, um, there's no one to look to as a what a man is supposed to be, what a husband is supposed to be, what is a father supposed to be, what, what is a man's role in, in the community. What I've experienced in the last um, 30 years of youth ministry is that it's not getting any easier, it's getting harder for kids. I have spoken at so many places where when I'm speaking about dear, being a dearly loved child, you can tell kids are like, don't talk to me about being a dearly loved child. You can take, talk to me about being put down, mocked, abused, taken advantage of, but I don't know what it is to be a dearly loved child. Fatherlessness is absolutely an epidemic. This has no respecter of race or you know, religion or socioeconomic bounds. The most important role, I think, or the thing that, that the father imparts into the home is a sense of identity for the home. And if you don't have a dad around, you get angry boys. You get um, girls who, who don't know who they are and they're constantly looking for love and acceptance in the arms of, of anybody who's gonna give it that way. See, a lot of the Hispanics come to this uh, country uh, dreaming with this big uh, American dream, wanting to have that. And unfortunately, they concentrate so much, they focus so much on working, making money, that they forget about their family, their kids. So the kids are at home by themselves and they don't feel that love. So what they do is they go outside the streets and find that. And they gangs, drugs, alcohol, violence, because they want to belong to something. The Bible tells us in the book of John, right, that the son does what he sees his father do. 
So if they're seeing a, a man come in and being abusive to their mom, they're seeing revolving doors of men, or men not stepping up and being responsible or accountable for their actions, well then, kids growing up are gonna, are gonna do the same thing. I think the enemy's one of the biggest cowards there is. Not that he's not um, wise um, as far as uh, crafty, you know. Um, in Genesis it tells that he was, um, you know, cunning, more cunning than all the beasts of the field. So he knows what he's doing, but he comes after each and every child at a young age in some ways. And when a family's broken or it doesn't have a father and a mother to be um, a protector, a spiritual lead, um, and to portray what a healthy look, uh, family looks like, it leaves that child or those children vulnerable to attacks from the enemy, whether it be from um, molestation, abuse, abandonment, absenteeism, you know, there's so many things that it just leaves the w door wide open for him to get through. Let's break this down according to military intelligence, right? There's an acronym in counterintelligence. It's MPCOA, Enemy's Most Probable Course of Action. In other words, on a spiritual level, if I were to put myself in Satan's shoes, how would I decimate a culture? Where would I start? What would be my number one strategy? What would be my starting point? How would I go about doing it? Well, it seems to me a very logical plan to get inside the nuclear family, take out dad, and for generations to come, breed and multiply broken girls and broken boys. And those boys go, go out broken, and guess what they do? They hurt more girls. They hurt their children. I got everybody? <laughs> yeah. All right, order operations for tonight. All right? Y'all see the camera here? So, real quick, who was in Colorado last year? There's a couple of y'all here. CJ, you the only one? Ian, Doug, Barry. All right, so where, where's Eric at? I lost you. So it's my friend Eric. Eat money. Eric runs Outdoor Adventures. He's the group that leads and sponsors us to go to Colorado. Like we've been telling y'all, we got two trips we're taking this year. One in June, one in July. As we've been mentioning, there'll be a variety of um, qualifications, prerequisites to go on this trip. One, of course, is your commitment to Tuesday nights. One is your ability to go on this pre-hike that we're going in April. Prior to the trips, there's a lot of prep work involved. But when you get out here, all of that doesn't mean anything. It's just mainly just loving on these guys. Uh, showing them that you're there and you're consistent in their lives. And when you can do that for them, there's transformation that happens. These trips right here kind of build those relationships even stronger. But it's not just about coming out and taking a kid camping. It's about digging in in their life, finding out what hurts they have that they may not even know they have. Finding out what their life is at home, what, what they go through, what the struggles they're going through, bullying, um, fatherlessness, poverty, racism, all of that stuff. So this trip right here is our boot camp. So what we're looking for is we're looking for leadership qualities because we want to make servant leaders out of the youth just like we are for them. We want to see um, teamwork. We want to see behavioral changes. And so we're keeping an eye out for a lot of key factors. It's not just hiking in, right? It's not what it's about. It's like, where, where are we going with your heart? Native American Ministries is America's forgotten mission field hey brother, in America's you in the cooler? That's what it is. We've seen so many young men and, and young ladies who grew up without fathers. They're the alcoholic or they're not there, or they're abusive. And it, this is the down spiral of reservations. And I see that not only here, but I see that it's a down spiral over you even in America. Here I see it clearer because it's more compact. 
But when you take the whole view of America, you know what? This is going all the way everywhere. And the greatest tool that the enemy can use is to attack the children. If they feel unloved, unwanted, and abused, he's got them. This is why it's so important to have fathers in the family. So important. The sad part about some fathers don't know how to be fathers. I didn't know how to be a father. It wasn't until I got into the Word of God that I realized how to be a father. A lot of minority men don't know how to tell their children, I love you. I recently started telling my children, I love them. You know, all these years I wasted. When I wish I'd have told them that. And you know what happened? They were surprised. They, said, they got back, what, what are we hearing from Dad? Just a simple word, I love you. And it, they, their, their eyes lit up. You know, and I thought, wow, God, you know, I, but I didn't have a good role model either. My father didn't tell me. His father didn't tell him. It's important that we tell our children we love them. They're our greatest treasure. <laughs> this is what I put on every ball that I signed. We got three of these we're going to do for raffle uh, drawings tonight. Bay Forest, number 35, sons, but what's important is my life verse right here. Colossians 3.23, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as oh, working my. for the Lord, not for men. Did you hear the difference there? See, I had a father who loved me. I called him daddy to the day he died. Well, that changed everything for me. When my daddy taught me that there was a heavenly father who loved me, I had no trouble or problem believing that because I had seen that. I had watched him live that out. And that's what we need for these young men and women to be able to see is older men and women that show what it is to love on them and to see that they can be cared for. And especially for the men though, for men to be those fathers to the fatherless is huge today because there are so many young men and women who have never experienced being loved or to understand that there is a heavenly father who they can say dearly loves them. When God instituted the family, he really intended that there would be a spiritual leader in every home and that every home would be a picture of uh, a small congregation, that there'd be a priest in every home, some scholars have said. And so I think that the Lord knows when the father is either absent, um, there's a fatherless home, or when the father is present but absent spiritually in leadership or in accountability or just providing love and encouragement, the Lord knows that that house is broken and when you have a broken man and then he's pouring into a, a, a son or a daughter uh, and, he, and they're seeing that brokenness poured out all over life, then you have a broken home. And then when you have a broken home, it leads to a broken community. I have noticed that there's a breakdown in how kids can picture a loving heavenly father. When that word father doesn't even connotate warm or loving feelings. When you haven't had a father that physically hugged you, encouraged you, told you you were beautiful, told you you were smart, strong, that they loved you, that they were affectionate with you, then how in the world can you turn around and imagine that this God of the universe loves you? It certainly left the greatest negative impact on the communities we serve. I grew up in the hood, predominantly black and brown neighborhood where fatherlessness runs rampant. And I always think, well, why didn't I want to get involved in the street gangs? I knew them guys, I could have. What was so different and special that I would, you know, choose another route? And, I, and, and now I know the significant role of having my father there. I mean, he went to work every day and worked very hard to provide for us. So I had, I had total security and safety, knowing that I was gonna have food and clothes and be just shelter and be taken care of. You take that away from a family, I mean, of course, kids are growing up 
without the basic necessities of life and entering into survival mode at a young age, I didn't have to worry about that. My father was there. And even though we were poor, just the model of, oh, that's what a man does. He provides for his family. And then him coming home and sitting us down for dinner, you know, so he was present. One of the biggest things that I've seen, and I experienced it myself also, uh, my parents divorced when I was two. Then I had a stepfather who was abusive, and that was for eight years in my life. And so what I experienced from that was um, a low self-esteem, not knowing my value. And I think when the father is absent from the home, that's the biggest str struggle for girls. They, they don't place enough value on who they are, and they end up making decisions um, most of the time, many times, um, promiscuous or um, addictions develop. They, they, they're wanting to fill that emptiness with something. And so they'll turn typically to the wrong things to try to fill that void. So my heart really breaks for the kids of the single mom, especially in the last year and a half. There are some kids that have not had a positive male influence in their life for over a year due to lockdowns or due to the situations that they go into. There's just no positive Christ-like male influence in their life. When they go home, um, sometimes even when they come to church, they could be taught by uh, women and great leaders who love the Lord and love Jesus. But there's sometimes this missing element that the kid needs to be encouraged from a, a male voice just saying, hey, you're loved, and again, you're enough, and God loves you and, and rejoices over you. Growing up, I didn't really have any male mentors in my life, so my mom asked me if I wanted to go to a camp for kids without dads, and me and my brother kind of started laughing about it and joking about it, and we're like, We'll give it a go. Eventually, we just came to the boot camp. Me and Eric hit it off really well. And me and my brother both got accepted into the program. And ever since then, we've been running with Outdoor Adventures and pursuing Christ. Think of the realm of possibilities for your lives. Our gentleman God has given you utter freedom. You could pursue a business career. You could be an accountant or a CPA or an engineer or blue collar or a snake wrestler, maybe a pro fisherman. I'm staring at Hayden for a lot of these last ones. <laughs> You're here because we see leaders that can make disciples. My name is Merrill Green. Really, I've never thought about it too much. Like, of course, I want to have a dad, wonder why he left, why he's not there. But I know that I should forgive him. But I just I, I'm really not in I, I don't feel like I can right now. Like, it's kind of hard for me to forgive a ghost. Do you think forgiveness is for him or for you? Pretty sure it goes both ways. I'm pretty sure I would be a whole lot better off if I just let go and forgive him for what he did than just hold on to it. You should do that. I should, but. You should do that. There's freedom waiting for you, man. It's just right there. Even if you never talk to him again. Yeah. It has helped me grow into the man that Christ wants me to be and help set examples for my peers and my little brothers out here at Outdoor Adventures. It has continuously helped me to grow spiritually, pursue higher education in college where I'm at. I'm a junior right now at Arkansas State, finishing up my senior year, and it has continually just blessed me and my family. So for walkabout, this is designed to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. PJ, this will be the toughest thing you've ever done physically. 
It's designed for that. That's what this is about. It's about a rite of passage. A rite of passage requires a little bit of pain. I want this to be a bookmark between chapter seven and eight in your life, where the rest of your life, looking back on this experience, you can say, this is when I became a man because I chose to become a man and put away childish things. And I chose to pursue God with all of my heart and to be his student and to be a disciple. This is where I met some of my best friends. This is where I began to really connect with a spiritual dad or a mentor, someone that I can really learn from. I think you could go to Genesis chapter 12. Uh, and you see Abraham's calling, and as he is called to leave his family, he takes a person with him, and that person is Lot. We don't know anything about Lot's dad or his relationship with his father, but we see Abraham pour into him and take him along on what God has called him to and that discipleship process that happens even then. And Lot wasn't perfect. He, he made a lot of mistakes along the way, uh, but God used Abraham's influence over Lot in so many ways. And then fast forward to the New Testament. Obviously, you see Paul with Timothy. Paul mentors Timothy, builds him up, encourages him. We see that Timothy's dad is a Greek. Uh, we don't know if he was a believer. We know his mom and his grandmother were believers. And so you start to see that role where Timothy needed a godly influence of a man in his life. And so again and again, you can see it through scripture, uh, the role of that and the significance of that. When you go to Psalms, uh, God calls himself a father to the fatherless. When you go to James, he says, pure and undefiled religion is to do this, look after orphans and take care of widows. And so if we can see the heart of God through those texts, then we can join him in his missions work. Now, in being baptized, you understand what baptism is, but something I really like to do is allow you to pick two people that will be baptizing you this morning. Who would you like to pick? I'd like to pick Thomas and Eddie. Thomas and Eddie. All right, come on up. Stand up here in the middle. Now, I want to also say this. As dudes, as men, we struggle to communicate things clearly sometimes and to be sentimental because we struggle with pride and insecurity. But I want you to understand that the Lord has given this man right here as your spiritual father. You can call him dad. He can call you son. Just know that he has your back. Okay? Moving forward in life. You're not alone, bro. You have a guy here who cares about you deeply. And he's going to rock with you the rest of your life. Isn't that cool? It's pretty epic, dude. He'll do anything for you. And the best part of all of it is that you have a heavenly father that's perfect. My relationship with Eric, uh, we met probably about four years ago at Centerpoint Church. I told him about my story and he told me his and we just had an instant connection. It's just amazing having a father figure in my life that actually is loving and caring about him. Healthy discipleship should always lead to change lives and change behavior. Discipleship gets straight to the heart of, of men and women. And so when someone is in a discipleship group that never puts into practice what they have been discipled in, then we know that we've just had, a, had an incredible study. We've exchanged information, but we have not tapped into the Spirit's transformation. And I think that's the role of discipleship. So discipleship will always cultivate a heart that looks like the Father's. And so when we have a heart that looks like the Father's, the same things that break His heart will break ours. The same things that moved Him to action move us to action. The same things that moved Him with compassion move us with compassion. And so clearly, as He says, I'm a father to the fatherless, and then you see that in the Old Testament, New Testament He comes and says, true and undefiled religion is to take care of orphans and widows. He's mobilizing His people on what His heart's mission has been from the very foundation of the world. 
And so without that outflowing, then our discipleship is incomplete. And my dad basically just took off. Uh, he chose to run away from the issues instead of step up and, and work through it. So I had men in my youth group. Um, I had uh, friends who had their fathers who were extremely present in my life, and they kind of became a father figure to me. Um, and that's the difference. That's the difference in the story. And it created a passion in my heart for students. Um, I had so many men and women pour into me that the Lord has just taken it and now I'm a youth pastor and who could have saw that coming? <laughs> At Arkansas State, I'm on the rugby team, and God is not a big part of that culture. It's a, it's a very work hard, party hard kind of culture, and a lot of the guys that I play with are from around the world, Zimbabwe, South Africa, England, and we've actually had a few guys come to Christ on the team. Me and a few of my teammates have been preaching to our teammates, just being a brother, helping them out, and showing them that there's more to life than just partying and drinking. You guys look on the upper left is where it starts, or can you chair, tent, my name is Caleb Beard, a.k.a. Bob Ross. I'm 17 years old. How did you get involved with Outdoor Adventures, Caleb? Uh, through Eric Swiffin um, coming alongside me and continually chasing my heart, even when I did not want him to at certain times. Just consistently walking up to me at youth group, consistently calling him out, consistently pouring into me, inviting me for on boot camp and different things like that taking me out shooting, taking me out and just pouring into me, um, asking how I'm doing, asking how my family is, and just things like that. He gave me Eric Swiffin as an earthly father figure who I can always look up to, but most importantly, it opened up the environment for to encounter um, God and experience him as a heavenly father and to further come into that revelation of his enjoyment in me and his affection and his love. Um, and the need for that to heal my own wounds that all of us have because none of our fathers are perfect. My heavenly father is God, my earthly father is Eric, and then my biological father is still pretty cool. We've all, we're on good terms and I've forgiven him and ever since I've forgiven him our bond together has grown stronger and it's led to the point where I'm able to pour into him about Christ and minister to him a little bit more. I love him so much. Um, there was a point in my life where I could never talk to him, but now this past semester, I just had a rough day. And for the first time in my life, I was able to call him and just hang out with him and just joke around. There's no doubt in my mind that I should be dead or in prison, period. And in the small percent chance that I did survive all that and became a dad, there's no doubt I would have continued that cycle. Maybe even exacerbated it, made it worse. Thanks be to God. He reached down, he rescued me, and he dusted me off. He's given me spiritual fathers. Through his word, I've learned what it means to be a dad. I have two of my own that adore me and I adore them. Going on 12 years of marriage, my temper is almost non-existent. And all of those things that I struggled with are in the grave with the old me. I don't struggle with alcohol or drugs anymore. My life is dedicated to the gospel and to serving my king. And what's so beautiful is that my dad never gave up. He pursued me. He asked me to forgive him over and over and over again, confessing all of his shortcomings. Multiple times, the Lord impressed upon my heart to forgive him and even ask him for forgiveness for being the teenager that I was. And because my dad never gave up, I could say 
with excitement that my dad and I are best buds. And now that he's been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, I have the privilege of walking with him in that, taking him to some of his doctor's appointments and to the cancer center and sitting in a boat, bluegill fishing in Tennessee and having conversations where we're belly laughing so hard you can't breathe and sharing memories that honestly they're tattooed in my brain forever i will cherish those memories for the rest of my life i went through some really really hard times personal times there was times when i felt like giving up and i turned to to alcohol to try to take the the edge off of all the stress but I never gave up. I went through some hard times, but those hard times made me stronger. Not, they won't tear you down, make you stronger and make you, make you a survivor. I can honestly tell you that the Lord has healed a vast majority of my woundedness. And now he's redeemed my story to be able to help others and inspire others with hope that there is no wound too deep that Jesus can't heal. And that even those that have endured the worst kind of trauma and pain, God wants to dust them off, make them a, a new creature, and send them into a mission that could change the world. I think the church needs to really pour into kids and to look after those who are single moms who have these kids growing up because they're so hungry for that interaction with godly men but also some of their guilt is on them that they think maybe dad's not around because of something wrong with me and if we can speak to the heart of that child and say you are fearfully and wonderfully made God has a plan to use what the enemy means for bad, and he's going to take that and use it for good. All things are going to work together for the good of those who are called according to his name, according to his purposes. Let's, let's remind them of the truths and the promises of God at a very young age so that they may implant it in their heart and be able to impact incredible amounts of people throughout their life. As a man, not only am I responsible to raise my family and be a husband to my wife, God has put me in a place to where I need to be able to open my doors and open my heart to others that he's put in because they don't have the same opportunity. So it starts with the church living a sacrificial life. Every letter, every gospel um, from Genesis to Revelation talks about sacrificial love. It talks about laying your life down for your friend, your neighbor, the orphan and the widow. And the church has failed in many ways to answer that call. And it's time for us to step up. The church is one and we have to work as one. If we don't come together for the purpose of the gospel, this is not gonna work. We have to come together and join forces. Today is the day, we have to do that. We have to do that. I love where it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Well, that's what we've got to do for, we got to challenge men in particular to step up and to run that race. It goes on and it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I love how it finishes though. It says, let us consider him who endures such opposition from sinful men so that we may not grow weary and lose heart. What do we gotta do? We gotta go hard all the way to the end. Well, if we're gonna reach a younger generation that doesn't know what it is to have a good father in their life, we've gotta not grow weary and not lose heart and push all the way through and let them see that Jesus is the answer and he can change a life, but if they don't see it in us, they're certainly not gonna want it for themselves. How can I make a difference? Show up. How can I make a difference? Be real. The same God that did the things back in the Bible days, he's doing it right now. And we're living in a generation where youth, they need the transparency. They need that. It's basic Bible and we're missing it. We want this, we want that, and we're missing the basic things that the Bible says. You can't minister to people when you're just in your comfort zone. If you'll let the Spirit use you, 
then you may end up getting outside of your comfort zone. But at the same time, you may start realizing that it's not about you anymore. It's about the kingdom. So it's about the impact you can have on somebody else's life. The principle of kingdom is multiplication. And so when we're working together and we're headed in the same direction, our efforts um, exponentially multiply. And so it's with Outdoor Adventures, Eyes on Me, with other ministries that we partner together and, and have a like mind and pursue the Father's heart. We are going to take back territory from the, from the enemy like nobody's ever seen. Um, when we're, we're not in it for our own personal agendas. We're not trying to build our own kingdom like they were doing in Genesis 11. We're trying to build God's. We're, we're not trying to make ourselves famous. We're trying to make Jesus famous. There's nothing that the church can't do when we get about our Father's business. God is such a redeeming God. Like, that's what He loves to do. He loves to redeem. And there's never, like, He doesn't stop. It's a process and it's for the rest of our lives. And He will completely restore and redeem whatever is broken. Isn't it a beautiful story of redemption? Doesn't it give you tremendous hope to think about the fact that a kid like me can now be a great husband and a great father? Isn't that wild? I mean, statistically speaking, I should be dead or in prison. And yet, I can stand before you today and say that I have an unbelievably beautiful marriage. I've got two babies and seven adopted boys. And I will tell you, I share most mornings with my kids. I share most dinners with my kids. I have a tremendously beautiful relationship with them. So how do I go about ending generational curses? It's only by the blood of Jesus and redemption that he's brought to me. And it's also through wisdom, right? So I have spiritual fathers of my own. One of them is a former NBA player named Bay Forrest. And I get to ask him questions. Isn't this cool? I get to ask him questions anytime I want about how to be a good daddy and a good husband. And I do, I ask him a lot of questions. And then more important than any of that, guess what? I get to open up the Word of God at any moment that I want to, and I get to study God's Word about what it means to be a godly man and how to raise babies and be a good husband, to love my wife as Christ loved the church, and to raise up babies who love Jesus. To me, I mean, it's unbelievably beautiful that God can take something so broken and turn it into something so gorgeous. In fact, I always like to say this, God has the most amazing recycling plan of all time. He literally wastes nothing, ever. Everything is for the good of those who love Him, and I love Him dearly. And not one single thing that we go through is wasted by our perfect Daddy. What does Jesus mandate? You know, He only gives a couple of really direct commandments to His followers to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, to love others as you would love yourself. And he also says to take care of the widow and the orphan, the poor and the marginalized. Many of the women who have fatherless kids, who, who may be divorced or, or abandoned, they are your modern day widows. The church is mandated to come alongside and say, we are with you, we see you, we want you to be a part of this body of Christ, you are valued here. There is life here. There is community here. You are not alone. God is with you, and so are we. That simple thing transforms lives. As I travel around the country and talk to different ministries in the inner city, different camps, uh, different parachurches and youth centers, there's a resounding theme that I'm hearing. As you look into the faces of these executive directors, the people that are on the front lines, you could see utter discouragement. The theme that I hear is that they can't seem to get churches involved. And so they're struggling not only to pay their bills and put food on their table as ministry leaders, but they're struggling to find people that can serve meals, people that can fix their facilities, people that can mentor their kids, people that can drive buses, people that can play instruments. So on one hand, we have these churches full of resources. And on the other hand, we have these ministries that are desperate for help. 
And now we know between 80 to 90% of those who come to know Jesus in their lifetime are under the age of 21. And yet we pour most of our resources into those that are older than 21. The most broken places in society are the places that Jesus would run to. God has designed and given us all specific works uh, behind our faith. And if you don't step up and, and be obedient to his calling in your life, to pour into a young man or a young woman or disciple somebody, because we're all called to discipleship. Students like me, if people didn't step up in my life, I don't know where I would be. So be the difference for somebody else. Be the difference for that student who's hurting, who's seeking validation. Teach them what it looks like to, to pursue Christ. My wife and I, one of our greatest blessings in this life is we've had the privilege of unofficially adopting seven boys who we've committed to pouring into all the days of their life. I know the men in the pews of the churches in America can handle unofficially adopting at least one fatherless boy taking them fishing with you, taking them with you to your men's ministry events, spending time with them, pouring into them, investing in them. And here's what I learned. If you look at the narrative of scripture, God's heart is for the broken. It's the sick who need a physician, not the healthy. When God sees suffering, his heart breaks and he runs right into the heat of battle to do something about it. So if you want to come alive in Christ and live the abundant life that God talks about in John chapter 10, all you have to do is participate in what Jesus is doing in the mission field in your backyard. <laughs>